staff have also engaged in regular training in multiple domains regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've held workshops for our BZ community of parents, grandparents, and alumni. We even have two seed cohorts, a parent and a faculty one, and the fact that they are filled to capacity speaks volumes to us about how thirsty we all are for this kind of work. We're proud of what we've done, and we are continuing to do. And we remain committed, as always, to the pursuit of compassion, justice, and ethical living. And here we are tonight at our first public community events. Again, we are so grateful that you've been able to join us tonight, and we hope you'll join us again to hear from Dr. Beryl Satter in March and, and Ms. Tonika Lewis-Johnson in April. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Joanna Thompson, sixth grade teacher extraordinaire, as well as the coordinator for diversity, equity, and inclusion here at Bernard Zell. Thanks, Gary. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is so exciting. We have over 200 people registered for tonight. It's just an incredible turnout from our Bernard Zell community, but also some, from folks joining us all across Chicago. We've got people here from Skokie, Evanston, Oak Park. We've got independent school teachers. We've got public school teachers. We've got folks in California and Idaho and Michigan. And I want to give a big shout out to my sixth graders who are here taking notes tonight so we can discuss in class next week. Thank you all so much for being here. A couple of quick logistics before we get going. There will be a recording available, so keep an eye out for the email that um, will be coming with information about that. Also, at the conclusion of Dr. Lewis's presentation, there will be a time for Q&A. Should you have a question that you would like asked, we have Bernard Zell faculty and staff managing the QA option. That is a little two speech bubble icon at the bottom of your screen, so you can click on that, you can ask a question, and time permitting, we will ask that for you at the end. There will also be times, perhaps during Dr. Lewis's presentation, that she would like to ask you a question. For that moment, she'll be directing her attention to the chat. So, when she asks for that, please go ahead and put your um, answers into the chat. That is a single speech bubble icon at the bottom of your screen. And if you aren't seeing either of those icons, perhaps uh, click on the three dots. That usually opens up the rest of the tools for you if they're, if they're hiding. I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker, Dr. Amanda Lewis. I first met Dr. Lewis three years ago at a summer education workshop for teachers at the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy at UIC. The workshop was so incredible to me. Um, to be in a room with other Chicago educators was remarkable, but to be taught by other Chicagoans who are rock stars in their academic field, it was incredible. Um, uh, Dr. Lewis was our opening speaker and I was hooked. The breadth of her work is remarkable. She is an author and co-author of many books, including this one, Despite the Best Intentions, How Racial Inequality Thrives in Good Schools. She is also UIC's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Distinguished Professor of Black Studies and Sociology. And most prescient for tonight, she serves as the Director of the Institute for the Research for Research on Race and Public Policy at UIC. Tonight, she'll be sharing data from the Institute's State of Racial Justice reports and helping us to consider how we are faring as Chicagoans in our city together. She's also a wife and a mom of a seventh grader. Please welcome me in joining Dr. Amanda Lewis. I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully. There we go. Um, can you see that okay? Yes? Okay. I'll assume yes. Um, well, I'm so excited to be here with all of you. Um, I am thrilled um, at the invitation from the Bernard Zell School to present some of this work. Um, and I should say, just as a, as a quick corrective, I'm actually on leave as director this year. I have, a, I have an amazing friend and colleague, Dr. Nadine Neighbor, who's um, being the interim director, but I will be back in, in May. And because most of the work in these reports is mine, I'm happy to, to um, be here representing that work. Um, for those of you who don't know much about the um, Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy at UIC, um, a core part of our mission is to increase society's understanding of the root causes of racial and ethnic inequality. Um, and to that end, we've spent the last four or five years um, 
writing uh, a series of reports, which you see the covers of here on this screen. Um, we began this work in large part because we were really interested in capturing the kind of full and complicated truth about racial dynamics in our city today. Um, and because we were really frustrated at the time with a lot of the popular narratives about Chicago that focus slowly, solely, excuse me, on stories about interpersonal violence. Um, we knew that the realities of Chicagoans' daily lives were much more complicated um, than stories about supposedly just violent communities um, that were described in national news stories. Um, in our reports, we document the experiences and conditions of life in the city for different groups and are regularly asking of ourselves as kind of driving question of this project, um, Chicago for whom? Um, across the reports, um, we find that racial and ethnic inequalities in Chicago remain pervasive, they remain persistent, and they remain consequential. Uh, these inequities affect the lives of all Chicagoans in every neighborhood, and they have not just spatial, but deep historical roots. Um, and they're embedded in all of our social institutions in various ways. They also have powerful effects on the lived experiences and opportunities of, of all Chicagoans. Um, and they're both about a legacy of the past, and I'll try to highlight some of those dynamics, and also result from persistent structural racism and discrimination um, today, including differential patterns of public and private investment in communities, different patterns of resource extraction from communities. I was really excited to see that we're having Beryl Satter coming in, um, her work um, chronicles this beautifully. Um, different patterns of educational opportunity across schools, communities, and different patterns of policing and justice. Um, tonight, I'm just going to highlight a few, well, I'm going to highlight more than a few, but I'm, I'm really touching the surface of a lot of these reports. Um, we often joke that our very first report, um, A Tale of Three Cities, um, was was uh, the headline about it in the Chicago Sun Times was lengthy report <laughs> documents racial inequality or something. Um, so um, I'm only going to share you parts of the reports with you today. But um, if you're interested in reading more, all of them are available um, for free for download at our website. Um, and we are also happy. It's a little more complicated in the current moment, but we do are happy to share hard copies um, with anybody who would rather. Um, interact with it that way. Um, and um, we also often give large bunches of copies to organizations who want to read them and process them. Now, before I get into the substance of our reports, I just wanted to say in particular how glad I am to be here with you tonight, um, because I think it's really important for schools to engage with this kinds of work. Um, I have been um, listening in, as Joanna mentioned, I have a seventh grader and I've been listening into so many of the school conversations that have happened over the last eight months about all the many events going on in the world, in our city. Um, and I will say, um, you know, we all have a lot of work to do. Um, over the last three years, we presented this report or all of these reports um, in dozens of places around the city um, to public officials, to philanthropists, to community organizations, activists, political entities, schools, churches. Um, and what has become clear in all of these conversations um, is that there are not surprising gaps in our local knowledge, not only about the facts of um, our history, about the racial dynamics of our history, but even of our present. Um, and so we've been collaborating with different groups, particularly recently Facing History has taken on this project about thinking about curriculum development around Chicago's racial history. But I also want to name that I know that a lot of amazing educators like your own Joanna Thompson have been doing this work in individual schools um, and um, how valuable it is for all of us as, as um, residents, as cities of Chicago, of the Chicago metro area, to have a much deeper understanding about our racial history and its legacy so that we can understand what's going on in the here and now. Okay, so um, I would love, as Joanna mentioned, to have you, um, if you can stand to, um, to share in the chat um, a little bit about why, um, why you decided to join us tonight. I, of course, have to figure out where the chat is on my screen. Um, well, I will figure that out. Um, oh, there, more chat. Yeah, there, now I can see it. Um, so for any of you who are willing, I know all of us are so 
slammed right now. And it's particularly those of us who have children, right before I was joining you, I was doing working on seventh grade algebra. Um, and so I'm always, I just want to know, like, what are the issues that you find most curious, most pressing? What is it that um, about the title of this talk or about the title of this series um, that brought you here tonight? Ah, oh, Miss Thompson is your teacher, lucky you. Um, committed to educate ourselves in this space. I just, it'll help me, it helps me to see what you're saying. Thanks for sharing. Um, um, keep keep going. I'm going to pause for a moment and see what folks have to say more about Mrs. Thompson. Uh, hopefully, hopefully for those of you um, who've joined because you were required to, um, it'll it'll it, it will not put you to sleep. Um, and also, substantive questions. So I'm going to take at the end. But if you have quick questions about clarification, go ahead and put them in the chat, um, and I will try to address them on the way. Um, Yes, absolutely. As a nerf midwife, I can imagine all this stuff. I'm seed facilitator. I love the seed program. I'm so glad to hear you guys are doing it. Um, okay, here we go. So um, please keep those answers coming. I'm, I'm really paying attention to all of them. Okay, so um, the first piece of data I want to share, and I'm a little bit of a nerd when it comes to this stuff. As Joanna said, I'm a sociologist by training, and I'm actually an ethnographer, but um, I think some of the information represented in these tables um, really helps us to understand um, differently uh, what we see going on in the city right now. Okay, so this is a table that shows Chicago's unemployment rate over a stretch of time, about 35 years. And there are a couple of things I wanted to note. One of the things that probably doesn't surprise many of you when you look at a table like that is that there are large differences in unemployment rates. But one of the things that I always like to point out when we look at it is we see, and this is sort of where the title of our first report came in, a tale of three cities, that the conditions for groups in the city really vary dramatically. And, and it's not enough to just think about white people and folks of color, that the, the range of experiences um, is quite large. So steadily over time, one of the takeaways is that Latino, Latinx unemployment in the city has always been about twice as high as white unemployment and black unemployment rates are anywhere from two to three times as high. Um, another important note in this though, in terms of how we think about even economic crises is that you'll note that the point in the last, you know, 10, 15 years when the US really thought of itself as being in a economic crisis is when white unemployment rates were around 8%. And you'll note on here that neither Black nor Latinx unemployment rates have ever been in the, in the immediate last decades anywhere near 8%. So that um, what we might think of as, as a crisis for some is a kind of daily reality um, for many. Um, and it's a really important way of thinking about how differently experiences are in the city. Okay. Thinking about um, Chicago compared to the rest of the country, this just tells us a little bit about median family income. And what you can see here is that, um, whereas in um, white families in Chicago have actually done pretty well over the last 50 years, the median family income has gone up dramatically and it's much higher than the rest of the country. The numbers are not as um, good when we look at Latinx and black families who remain pretty flat and in, and in some ways are either uh, similar to the rest of the country or actually in terms of African-American families doing less well. Um, so another kind of interesting point of comparison to think about. Um, okay, I'm going to talk a lot more about wealth gaps at the end of this talk because we're just finishing up a new report about this. Um, it is for us one of the best measures when we think about both the legacies of inequality from the past, the kind of legacies of structural racism, and about current practices and policies that make life either easier or harder for different families. Um, one important thing about wealth is that we often think it's somehow about income or about different savings rates, but I can tell you the, the overwhelming abundance of research in sociology and economics shows that these wealth differences are about intergenerational transmissions of resources. So this is about the wealth of our families and how that gets transmitted over time and not at all about whether we're spending differently or whether we have different income rates. Um, these, these wealth gaps are large and they're stable across whether we control for income, um, education, I'll show you more data at the end, 
This is data that actually um, is national. We don't have great data locally in Chicago. I'll show you what we have in a minute, but it does show how large the income, the wealth differences are, um, where white families have anywhere from 18 to 20 times the wealth of Black and Latinx families. Um, okay, so this is the data we do have um, for the local region. Um, and what we see here is that about twice as many Black and Latinx families have had what we call zero or negative net worth. This means, in essence, they have absolutely no safety net. So any minor crisis um, in the household um, is devastating. Um, and it's a really important indicator also because it raises a whole host of questions around things like, for instance, why so many organizers and advocates for justice have pushed hard in recent years for um, to end cash bond. Um, system, which essentially means when you get arrested for something, can you put up enough cash to get out until you're held for trial? Well, you can imagine looking at these kinds of numbers that for some families that is basically impossible, which is why we had so many folks um, sitting in Cook County Jail for uh, months, if not years, awaiting um, trial. Okay. Um, Here's another important indicator. So we often think about um, making about $15 an hour as a kind of bare minimum for a living wage. And what we see in this data is that over time, um, while the numbers have gotten better for some, they've gotten worse for others. Um, in our most recent data we had available, over half of Latinx workers in the city of Chicago are making less than $15 an hour. So whereas before we saw with unemployment that more Latinx workers, I mean, more Latinx people are employed, their, their unemployment rates are somewhat lower than for African-Americans. They do tend to be employed in jobs where they are um, not making as much money. Um, so again, a kind of indicator about different kinds of experiences, um, which is why we're not entirely surprised when we see, for instance, that unemployment, uh, excuse me, uninsurance rates for Latinx families is so high. Um, and you can imagine what this all means in the current context of the COVID crisis in the city, and in part why we have seen um, Latinx communities so devastated um, by the pandemic, partly related to the kind of jobs people have, partly related to access and to healthcare, et cetera. Um, okay, now I wanna switch to talking a little bit about um, criminal justice. Um, this has been a topic of major discussion, um, relationships between communities and police, um, conditions around the state in terms of uh, questions about mass incarceration. Um, I'm happy to talk more about this in the Q&A. Um, but one of the things that is true is that while all states nationally have engaged in this experiment in recent years of incarcerating more and more and more people, we now incarcerate more folks in the United States than any other industrialized nation. Um, our, our incarceration rates, well, again, I'm happy to talk more about all of that, but it has lots of different kinds of consequences. One is just when we think about um, spending in the state and where we are investing. Um, and this is just one measure which shows how much direct expenditures on criminal justice have gone up over um, this period of time when we were expanding. Um, and what it has meant in terms of our investment in other kinds of public goods, which have often um, decreased significantly. Um, another measure I was looking at recently with regard to our wealth report, which I'll talk more about later, um, has to do with financial support for higher education in the state, which has dropped almost 50%, 50% just in the last 20 years. Um, so as you, you know, there are always going to be um, trade-offs. Ah, do people, do students know what incarceration means? It means how many people we have locked up in jails and prisons in the state. And in fact, Illinois, for better or for worse, is a leader nationally in this. We incarcerate high numbers of people. And we, in fact, have the most overcrowded state prisons in the country. Most of the state prisons are operating at over 150% capacity. Um, this is not obviously a fact that we might want to be proud of, um, but you can see the incarceration rates vary dramatically uh, across groups. And I'm including here some of the data from our uh, subsequent reports, which I'll mention later, including the data on for um, Native Americans um, in um, the state, partly because I want to highlight we often focus importantly, rightly on mass incarceration of African American communities, but incarceration rates for Native Americans um, even, even a small population um, remain um, very high. 
um, and worth um, some real consideration about what is going on. And particularly when we look at incarceration rates for um, women, we see that um, whereas black women um, are the fastest growing group in prisons, per capita Native American women are the most vulnerable to arrest and punitive action from the criminal justice system. Um, and again, one of the really surprising things that came out of a report I'll mention in a second that we um, are engaging with community partners to try to make sense of and try to think about what it means for people's experiences. All of this translates into thinking about how money is spent. As you all know, there have been um, vigorous and important debates going on in recent months about spending, about um, spending on policing in the city, and in particular, about what it is that makes communities and neighborhoods feel safer to the residents who live there. Um, this is some really um, um, important data that comes from one of our partners, DataMade. Um, they did a project looking at spending on incarceration in different neighborhoods. And what you can see is that over this period of time, um, more than half a billion dollars was spent just on residents of Austin um, in, term, um, in incarcerating folks, right? So we can imagine all the other ways that those kinds of resources might get deployed to meet community members' needs around employment or education or housing or health. Um, and the um, the amount of spending varies dramatically across neighborhoods. You could see Austin as a high for the city, whereas um, the um, Lincoln Park um, represents a low, very dramatically far on the, on the other end. Um, okay. Um, one other way that people, one other important measure that people have been talking about a lot recently is just the amount of money we have been spending on um, payments for um, misconduct um, from the Chicago Police Department. Um, again, our goal here, and I should have said this at the beginning, was not to collect new data, but to bring together in one place the existing data about economics, housing, um, neighborhoods, uh, education, incarceration. Um, and I'm only showing you just the surface here, but this is important data it comes from the city of Chicago actually, which shows um, the scope over time of the amount of money being spent yearly, um, upwards of 80 million, 90 million dollars often um, in recent years to cover um, these expenses. And this is related very much to complaints filed um, against the department. Um, and we can see here already that there are large differences in the number of complaints filed by different communities and which complaints are actually sustained. Um, what that means here is that although Black Chicagoans file over 60% of complaints against the Chicago Police Department, um, those complaints are sustained only about 25% um, of the time, while White Chicagoans have inverse numbers filing just over 20% of complaints, but having those sustained over um, just under 60% of the time. Um, and overall, less than 2% of the almost 30,000 complaints filed against the police department between 2011 and 2015 resulted in any kinds of disciplinary action. Again, I highlight these numbers partly because when we are talking a lot, when these national narratives about Chicago as a place of rampant interpersonal violence um, become the story of our city, one of the answers often is, what do we need? We just need more police and we need more police in certain communities. And what often we hear from the folks actually living in those communities is that um, more policing is not necessarily what is going to make them feel safer, feel taken care of, feel like a full member of the larger community. So again, important questions about how we're spending and where and how it, in, what impact it's having on different communities. Okay. Now, now one of the things you might have noticed in that first report, um, in the discussion of that first report, is that um, I didn't mention Asian Americans at all. When we were doing the initial analysis for that report, which focuses on Black, Latinx, and white communities primarily, um, we tried to include Asian Americans and Native Americans as the other two large categories captured by the census. And the numbers were small, they were wonky. I will show you some in a second. So we committed ourselves at the time to um, having separate reports about those two groups. And in doing so, it became clear why it was so important to, to do that. Um, and I'll tell you, um, you can see in some ways actually by the title of this report, um, which was a tale of diversity, disparity, discrimination, 
that one of the major reasons why we didn't want to have Asian Americans represented as a single category in the other reports was both because so much data was missing, but also but because collapsing all the disparate groups that count as Asian American into one really, um, in some ways, flattens and mischaracterizes their experiences. OK, what do I mean by that? Um, OK. So historically, Asian Americans in the United States have had to contend with these two kind of dueling racial mythologies about them. And you can sort of see this captured in some of these images. One of the mythologies is this idea that they are model minorities, that they are um, models of assimilation and examples for other racial and ethnic groups of what is possible with hard work. This is not a narrative they've told about themselves, but it is a narrative that the larger culture has tried to project at least onto them. Um, the other um, stereotype or the other mythology that Native American, excuse me, that Asian Americans have to contend with um, is this idea that they are forever foreigners, that they are never fully accepted as truly American or they're seen as being in some ways un, um, unassimilable. Um, and we see this in kind of a different form of racism around nativism. Um, and a lot of this came out um, during the pandemic um, as many Asian Americans here in Chicago and elsewhere experienced um, many forms of actually pretty explicit um, racism related to this kind of forever foreigner stereotype um, and related to um, a lot of uh, stereotypes that were being perpetuated by nationally around the source of the disease and who was responsible for COVID. Um, and so that persists and it persists in different ways in terms of thinking about people's conditions and experiences. Um, as I said, there was, these were the kind of three big themes of the report. I'm only gonna show you a couple data points that help um, illustrate what this means, but hopefully um, you'll get a sense of it. Um, so one of the important things to know about Asian Americans um, is that Chicago is actually the seventh largest Asian American population in the US nationally. Um, we have the largest population in the Midwest where that big blue circle in the middle um, and that Asian Americans are actually the fastest growing racial and ethnic group in the city of Chicago. Um, but that larger umbrella includes underneath it many, many, many different groups. And this is just some of them. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and one of the ways that stereotypes about Asian Americans as model minorities actually harms the community is that it really masks the vast diversity within the category and the challenges within that category. It somehow suggests that all Asian American groups are doing quite well. So for instance, Asian American groups are often um, talked about as being the most educated among all um, groups in the US. But you can see from this table, which is a little complicated, but the biggest takeaway that I want you to see is that some Asian groups, particularly for instance, um, South Asian Indians are among the most educated um, of all groups, while other Asian American groups, particularly here look at, for instance, Cambodians are among the least educated. So as where the vast majority of, of um, South Asian Indians in Chicago have a college degree, far more Chicago Cambodians have not even made it through high school. So when we talk about Asian Americans generally as this highly educated group, we lose all this kind of wide range in experiences across different um, nationalities and ethnicities within the group. Um, this is also true when we look at um, data on things like median um, income, Native household income. This kind of figure shows Asian Americans as doing quite well vis-a-vis -vis other groups. Um, and then we look again um, at a figure that disaggregates across groups. Um, we, we see is that while Filipino households, for instance, are doing quite well, making almost $10,000 a year um, as a household more even than, than white households, the median household income of um, other groups, Bangladeshis, Cambodians, um, even Koreans is much lower um, and speaks to a different kind of experience um, in the city. Okay, I'm gonna um, talk about one or two more and then skip over a few. Um, the other thing we talked about in relation to disparity is that Asian Americans, in fact, um, it's hard to tell when you look at those numbers, they seem to be doing somewhat well, but when we actually look deeper into it, what we find is that Asian Americans should be doing much better, at least in terms of things like income than they currently are. Um, one of the ways that we often measure um, 
uh, think about equity across these things is what kind of returns do you get to education? So the more education you get, does your income go up? And what we find is that returns on education for Asian Americans are much lower than they are for um, whites, for instance, and that um, they're experiencing what we call a racial wage gap that's large and particularly large across um, uh, you know, various somewhat by industries. I know I'm going fast here. I'm just trying to give you a flavor of some of the big highlights. Um, and then in the Q&A, we can um, go over as many details as you want. Um, one last thing. So this again related to the kind of stereotype we talked about at the beginning about Asian Americans as being foreign, even for people who are many generations in the United States, is to look at a table like this in which we found when we look at that racial wage gap, or how much, um, how much less Asian Americans are making than they should be when compared to other groups along similar lines in terms of education and that sort of thing. What we found is that for those who speak English less than very well, who have any kind of accent, the cost to Asian Americans is much higher than it is for other groups. So um, when compared to um, white folks who have an accent, they make 45% um, less when compared even to Latinx folks, they make 11% less. So again, partly these things have consequences for groups depending on the kinds of racial mythologies and stereotypes that projected onto them. Um, the report we did next was on um, Native Americans in Chicago. Um, and we had been thinking about this report since we started. Um, and sort of like, um, as with for the Asian Americans, we didn't do it right way, right way, right away, because it was going to be really complicated. And I'll tell you about the the challenges in a moment. Um, but I also want to acknowledge and own the fact, as we talked about to a lot of different community groups that we worked with, that by not including Native Americans in the original report, we were participating in a long history of erasure of them in our community. Um, there are lots of ways that I'll talk about. We think of Native Americans as part of this long ago people who used to be here and not as much about Native Americans in our present. Um, we are a major population center for Native Americans. I'll talk about that more. Um, and as we work through these issues of data with our community partners, they said to us clearly over and over again um, that it was important to do this report even though it was gonna be complicated and it was going to be imperfect. Um, so one of the challenges right away was about the politics of counting and who counts as Native American and who decides. So there have been long running battles in this country around sovereignty, around self-determination, around how Native Americans have been racialized and counted. So for instance, the census, which is primarily a measure that uses um, self-identification, has much higher numbers for uh, people claiming Native American then are counted through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, which collects data from uh, recognized tribes. Um, so the data that I'm gonna show you today is all from the census. Um, right now, it's the best we have available. Um, it's also challenging to do a report like this on Native Americans because the numbers are small. And so there's certain kinds of data analysis we did for other reports that we just couldn't do for this group. Um, and finally, we, we the kind of nuance that we were able to do for the Asian American report around disaggregating among groups, we also weren't able to do for tribal affiliation um, because the numbers just got too small. Um, so this report, as I said, reflects the kind of best that we could do um, given what's available. Um, the other complicated thing um, in doing this report is about the politics of naming. Um, and we have uh, several pages in each of the front of the reports where we really discuss the kind of politics of thinking about um, how we name racial categories, how we use the racial categories and names that we get from others. Um, and so I'm happy to talk a little bit about that. It's one of the things inevitably that happens in social science research is that we have to um, identify categories and name them, but there's a lot of violence in those categories that gets um, forgotten often when we're doing them. Um, as many of you may, may know, the racial labels we use are deeply tied to these histories of settler colonialism and, um, and racism and subjugation in this country. Occasionally I look down at my phone because there's a whole chat going in to make sure my sound is okay. I'm sorry if I sometimes seem distracted. Um, 
But um, when we, in fact, got the label American Indian because when Christopher Columbus got lost and landed in territory that is now considered part of the Americas, he thought he was in the Indies in South Asia and insisted on referring to those he met as Indians. And this label, which emerged out of the kind of brutal history that of colonialism that followed his arrival, um, was then assigned to thousands of disparate peoples who had different traditions and languages. Um, and it was only many hundreds of years later that it was taken up as a self ident as an identity by the pan-ethnic groups considered to be American Indian. So again, when we spoke to community groups, we talked a lot about the politics of labels in which to use and agreed with them that we would use Native American, we would also use American Indian when using the census data, and also use um, urban native to reference um, Native Americans living in large cities. Um, okay. Um, so one of the important things, one of the important dynamics that we confront in this report is, as I talked about earlier, the kind of dominant portrayals of Native Americans that relegate these groups to the kind of distant past or to present day caricatures without any context. Um, the images you see here are all images from the Chicago area in one way or another. They're either art that you see here in public spaces. Um, the diorama in the middle comes from the long-term Native American gallery at the Field Museum that is currently being completely redone. We see, of course, Chief Alina Wick, who no longer is the official mascot. There's images everywhere around um, University of um, Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And we see the symbol for the Chicago Blackhawks. Um, so beyond their appropriation as images for sports teams, when Native Americans are depicted in US culture, they are often um, stereotyped as either being fierce savages and bloody confrontations with frontiersmen or as noble in some way, as wide stewards, wise stewards of the earth. But all of these things collectively, um, in some ways, as I said, erase um, the presence of Native Americans today um, as part of our city, as part of our communities, um, and that was one of the, the um, biggest issues that came up in our conversation with the community groups is how to emphasize um, the struggles and needs um, and thriving of Native Americans in Chicago currently. Um, I showed you some of the data comparing their experiences and conditions to other groups earlier. I just wanted to show a couple other quick things. One is that um, Chicago is the ninth largest um, urban Native American population in the United States. It's the second largest population east of the Mississippi and the largest in the Midwest. We have almost 40,000 Native Americans in Cook County. Um, so Chicago is, as I said, a major population center. Um, we have a common myth that Native Americans are primarily a rural population, but in fact today at least half, likely a little more than half, of Native Americans nationally are actually living in cities. So thinking about their experiences in cities where they are coexisting with lots of people from different tribal affiliations is a really important thing about understanding their experiences. Um, the voices of Native American people um, have been critical in the city and challenging their um, hyper visibility as caricatures, as well as the stereotypes of them as being kind of relegated to the past or to reservations. Um, they're playing a huge role today in a couple big um, efforts to kind of change um, their depiction. In particular, um, Native American voices have been central to recent efforts to completely rethink um, the Field Museum um, and the, its Native North American Hall, which had remained the same since the 1950s. Um, but as with mascots and other things, there is much work to be done. Um, although the Native American Graves and Protection uh, Repatriation Act um, was passed in 1990, a number of museums, including the Field Museums, continue to have um, human remains and funerary objects in their possession. Um, and it's, it's a subject that's um, subject to much um, discussion. Currently. Okay, two more quick um, things. I'm going to switch topics again right now. Okay, so one of the our most recent report that was that was actually uh, published last spring um, was about um, what was going on with the black population in the city of Chicago. Um, there had been a lot of media attention about black out migration in the city. I'm sure some of you saw it. And there had been a lot of speculation that Blacks were leaving Chicago in huge numbers because either of interpersonal violence or because, and I'm sort of joking here, everybody was moving back to Atlanta. Um, 
And our goal for this report started actually very small. We thought we would just do like a little policy brief or something. We sat around our conference room asking, what's really going on here? Are people leaving? How many people are leaving? Where are they going? Um, and what can we learn um, from these patterns um, about what's going on for Black residents of Chicago um, right now? Um, and I'll tell you, the report was not meant to be a kind of definitive answer as to whether Black residents are being pushed out or moving elsewhere for opportunity. But we were trying to understand population trends in the city vis-a-vis -vis other groups and what this could tell us about what was going on right now in Chicago. Um, so one of the things we did right away was to contextualize the last 10 or 20 years in a longer span of time. And I'll show you what population trends look like over 100 years. And what we find from this vantage point is that population trends for Black residents of Chicago are associated quite closely with trends and levels of racial inequality, um, as indicated by things like unemployment and wages. Um, when inequality in Chicago was lower than many Southern cities during the mid 20th century, Black migration to Chicago was very high. Um, after 1980, however, racial inequality in Chicago became worse both compared to historic levels in Chicago and compared to other cities nationally. And at this point, a lot of black Chicagoans did start to leave the city. Um, so that's one major um, point of comparison. Um, viewing these kind of population um, um, trends over a longer period of time, we think are really helpful because they help us to think about how these inequities have been built into the fabric of Chicago, either both before and after the great migration. Um, and particularly how the segregation of Black residents to the Black Belt and subsequent economic disinvestment and extraction um, pre-1980 and post have really driven a lot of what's been going on. Okay, so what am I talking about? Well, let's just look at one piece of data. And this shows a white, Black, and Latinx population movement in and out of the city over since 1930. Um, and what you can see here is that um, from 1950 to 1970, um, a period of time when the black population of Blacks in Chicago more than doubled, was also a period of time of what we often think of as white flight, when a lot of whites were actually leaving the city and moving out to the suburbs. Um, and just as local, state, and federal government policies played a substantial role in the segregation of Blacks in communities and cities, I'll show you some of those maps in a second, white suburbanization at this time was also a highly subsidized um, by public policy and driven in many ways by federal, state, um, and local policies, which facilitated that exodus. Um, as white residents moved out, investment also declined, and banks were much less willing to give loans to businesses and invest in certain communities. Um, and this led to what we often talk about as the kind of disinvestment um, in many, um, particularly Black Southside communities. Um, and we see this, again, in the trends of when people have come and gone. And in particular, I think it's worth noting that the period, in fact, when we might have labeled as a kind of black exodus was really um, between 2000 and 2010. And the story has kind of changed in the years since. So we're often catching up to things that happened a while ago. Um, we also see in this table that there has been a large growth in Latinx population over the last 30, 40 years, um, sort of flattening out in the present moment. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens um, in the post-pandemic numbers when people are often theorizing a lot of people are leaving the city. We'll see. Um, what you can see here is how, um, the, as Blacks moved into the city over time, they were forcibly contained for many decades within what we label as kind of Black belts on the south side of Chicago. After the Fair Housing Act banned more formal and explicit practices such as restrictive covenants and um, we do see some geographic spread, um, but we still have what is termed a kind of hyper segregated city. Chicago remains one of the most segregated cities in the country, um, and African Americans um, in the city are one of the most segregated groups. Um, okay, I'm going to show just a, one or two things here, and then I want to talk about the last report, and then I will promise I will wrap up, and hopefully we'll have time to have lots of conversation. Um, so actually, I'm going to skip to this. So this is just captures what I was talking about a little bit earlier, that when you look at Chicago, Chicago is the black line in this table. Um, when Chicago's um, 
when some of the indicators of equality in Chicago, this includes segregation, it also includes wage gaps and other things. When Chicago was doing better, when it was place of opportunity for African Americans vis-a-vis -vis other cities, particularly in the South, a lot of folks were moving here. Starting in the 1980s, when Chicago, in fact, became both compared to itself and compared to these other places, less of a place of opportunity, that's when folks started to leave and move to other um, cities um, generally. Um, the other thing though we point out in this report is that you really can't talk about one story for the whole Chicago, that the dynamics vary dramatically across neighborhoods and that what's going on in neighborhoods varies dramatically. When our report was first coming out, I got calls from reporters in other cities like San Francisco that were like, oh, is this a story? This is about gentrification, just like it was in San Francisco when family. And I said, not really. I said, it depends on the neighborhood that you're looking at. That is, of course, absolutely the story for the near north side. Um, if you look at the numbers here, what we know, and this is very much about the plan for transformation and about the destruction of public housing in the city, there are certain communities near north side is where the um, long standing Cabrini Green housing was. This is a community where um, gentrification happened rapidly and where lots of African Americans were displaced. Um, and but when we look at other areas, for instance, on the south side, what we're really looking at is just population loss. We aren't looking at the fact that people are getting pushed out by new populations moving in. So again, we need to think about the dynamics quite differently um, across different communities. And I, again, am so excited that you'll be able to talk to Beryl Satter when she comes about contract leasing and what an impact it had in different communities. That's a major story driving what happened in, for instance, in Englewood when many black homeowners essentially um, had their um, homes taken away and lost uh, much of the investment they had made in the community for many years. Um, just a little teaser for the next talk. Um, anyway, one of the things I was gonna ask you in the chat, but we are, um, uh, I'm, I'm a little over, I'm about to be over on time, um, was this question I was asked people was like, where do you think people are moving to? And again, people often say everybody's in Atlanta, maybe other parts of the South. And the big story here is that both for black and white residents, people aren't actually moving very far. More than half of the folks who have left Cook County have moved in fact to other parts of the metropolitan area. They're in Will County, they're in Kane County, they're in Hammond, Indiana, they're in Gary, Indiana, they're in North DuPage County. So there is a little bit of a story. You can see um, about 2% of movers have moved to Atlanta. Um, you can see that a little bit, even for white folks who've moved in the last couple decades, moving to Arizona. Um, but for the most part, what we see is that people are actually not moving very far away, that there is a big pull for people to stay in the Chicagoland area. Um, and that this isn't being driven by some major um, return migration to the South. Okay, um, I wanted to give you a little teaser. So one of the things that happened when we were doing the reports that I just discussed is that we committed ourselves, as I said, not to collecting new data because there was so much data existed and we wanted to just bring it together in one place and we wanted to bring it together in a way that was accessible. Um, hopefully I have made it seem somewhat accessible tonight even though I probably talked about too much of it. Um, but we also made a list of things that we didn't feel like we knew enough about and that we wanted to eventually collect some data about when we could. And so one of these things was about um, patterns and racial gaps in wealth. Um, racial wealth gaps, as I've said, many um, social scientists think of as one of the measures that most captures the depth and breadth of racial inequality in our country. Um, I will come back to the slide. I'll just show you a couple measures um, this is, uh, these are measures of um, net family worth by race and ethnicity. Um, and you can see how much higher the median net worth is for white families than it is for either black or Latinx families. Um, the source of people's wealth is also vastly different. White families are much more likely to have um, a wide range of other assets. Whereas for most black and Latinx families, the majority of whatever else wealth that communities own is in their homes. And the other thing we see, and people often ask me about how this is shaped by education levels, and actually, you know, having education obviously increases people's incomes and does have some measurable impact on their wealth, but not in the same way across groups. So if we compare those who don't have bachelor's degrees to those who do, we see that whites have vastly more um, wealth. 
And again, um, this is not at all about um, um, the uh, savings rates or even income. It's about intergenerational transmissions of resources. And I'm gonna go back to this slide. So we interviewed a hundred families, black, Latinx and white families, middle-class families. So we were trying to compare people who all had college educations, who all had professional managerial jobs to try to understand their experiences around wealth and, um, and how, where it came from, how they got resources from their families, when they gave it to their families. And there are just several broad patterns um, that I wanna um, tell you about that really characterize um, what I would call an overall experience in which um, some middle-class families in the city are really thriving and many are really struggling these days um, and not struggling because they aren't working hard, not struggling because they didn't get college educations or they don't have good jobs, but because of uh, other factors outside of their control. So families are having really vastly different experiences. If we just look at indicators of education and income often in any of our data, we miss all of this because none of that includes data about family wealth. Um, one of the major things we find in our data that exists, as I said, in other data is that so much of this is driven about who, by who gets resources from their parents, from their grandparents, and who is in fact giving support to their families. So for most black and, Latin, black and Latinx uh, middle-class families in the city, um, they are often the first generation in their families to go to college. They are often, even if they're struggling financially, the most well off among their extended family. So they are often a source of financial support to extended family members in the way that even white middle and upper middle-class families are still receiving um, support from their parents. And this isn't just about like um, inheritances, but it's also about all the ways that people had some, their college educations paid for or not, um, help buying the first home or not, help paying for childcare or not. So what we find is that these folks are really starting their adult lives on very different trajectories. Um, one of the most disturbing things we find, again, not surprising given national data we see, is how much student loan debt. So for folks striving to get a college education, um, we push a lot today on the idea that college, everybody needs a college education to get by. But because of public um, declining public support for higher education, that means for many families having to take on huge amounts of student loan debt, which really sets them off on a different trajectory for their adult lives than is true for others and makes it very difficult for them to plan for the future. Um, the final thing I just will highlight is that some of this really is about the legacies of the past, the kind of things we talked about earlier, the kind of long legacy of the ways that wealth accumulation in past generations was subsidized for some groups and not for others. But it's also about a lot of ongoing failures in the present. It is about how we support higher education, how we support families. So whereas some families are able to, to pay for their own social safety net, to pay for childcare, to pay for all these things, the way we've declined in support for these things for families has meant that other families are going into a lot of debt to try to manage and juggle all of these things. Um, okay, I, I could say a lot more, but I'm going to stop because um, I've said too much, uh, more than I meant to. Um, and I'm going to hopefully, um, Joanna will join us back now and help facilitate um, our conversation. Um, and we can try to make sense of how all this adds up together. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Lewis. That was like drinking from a fire hose, I think. I, I'm i like trying to take notes and um, sixth graders, you're, if you're still here, well done. You may have noticed that one of the very first slides she showed was one that we looked at in class. So keep that in mind. Um, and I'm well, happy to come visit your class and talk about it all so we can. Oh, well, we would love that. Oh my goodness. Um, while you're kind of catching your, your breath and taking a drink of, of water, um, I want to highlight for folks the, the National um, Day of Racial Healing, which is coming up on the 21st. So um, go ahead and look at that. It's um, uh, I'll put the, the, the link to it, but there's events all throughout the city um, uh, that you can um, attend for that. Um, Amanda, I'm sorry, Dr. Lewis, um, if teachers are interested in attending the summer education workshop, um, what what do you recommend they do? Or if they're interested in finding out more about these, these reports and reading them themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the Institute does a workshop every summer that Joanna talked about at the beginning. Um, we unfortunately had to cancel it last year 
for obvious reasons. We will have it this year. We're a little bit debating whether we're just going to go ahead and plan a virtual conference or whether we will plan on maybe having it in person. Either way, it will be happening. And you, if you go to our website, you can um, sign up to join us. Um, it's at irrpp.uic.edu. And we make it very affordable. So even if you don't have professional development money, we almost we waive almost all the fees and stuff. So we hope you and anybody else who'd like to can come join us. Um, and all the reports are also available there. So if you want to look at any of the data or dig in deeper, um, we regularly make the reports available to teachers around the city. So we've had teachers get you know dozens of copies to use of their classes. But like I said, they're available electronically. And we also have all of the, any of the figures you saw today, any of the data tables, they're also available individually on our website. So you're welcome to, um, we ask people just to acknowledge where they're from, but you're welcome to borrow them, use them, share them in any form you like. That's fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, we do have a few questions that are coming in, and there was one um, attendee who shared a number of great links that only the panelists could see. So um, oh. the, the BZ staff is going to share that. That was a, um, having to do with a lot of the slides that you shared around Asian American experiences. So um, just want to let that, pan that attendee know that we're going to go ahead and share that with the whole group. Um, one question is, you know, the, kind of a bombshell question, but um, you know, you and the Institute have been collecting this data for a number of years. You're definitely not the first group to sort of like tackle like the racial inequality in Chicago. We think about the the 1919 report after the the riots um, and that whole co that whole biracial coalition or commission to find out what do we need to do. And so uh, here we still are in our city and the nation at large. So what do you what do you think is the biggest barrier to lasting racial equity? What what do you um, okay, that's a big question. And there are lots of answers to it. I will say at some basic level, one of the biggest uh, reasons why change is hard um, is because um, some groups benefit from the way that things are currently organized. So um, we see in lots of ways that the, um, I, you know, I was talking a lot about how some groups are struggling in certain dimensions, but other groups are thriving. And um, it is not an accident that um, that those groups don't necessarily have a lot of interest in things changing. There's lots of ways of talking about that. I could, I'm, I'm trying to think of some good examples. So I'll, I'll give one from my book. It's like, I think it's very concrete and easy to see. So um, in the book that you held up at the beginning on despite the best intentions, there it is. This is not from my reports. This is from my research in schools. Um, one of the things we study in that book, we look at is um, uh, racial segregation in tracking in high schools and how that how it happens, why it happens, why why it hasn't changed. In especially in communities, we look at one community in particular where there's a lot of commitment to um, closing racial gaps in achievement and uh, improving racial equity, um, but there's still this. Um, deep segregation and, and tracking and um, essentially that um, whites are far overrepresented in high tracks and, and blacks and Latinx students are far represented in, in kind of low tracks. Um, and what we find is the, the patterns of, of what generates those things um, when, we, we want, when we kind of tell the story about why racial, racialized tracking persists even though we know that it's really destructive to the experiences of a lot of students and doesn't necessarily benefit, um, well, getting rid of it wouldn't, wouldn't hurt people. I mean, we could talk about detracking. But anyway, the main point I wanted to say is that when we talk to educators about why they haven't introduced change, why they haven't tried to, to really confront some of the things that they know are getting in the way of racial equity in their schools, they talk about white families and white parents in particular who often get in the way of change because their kids are benefiting from the ways that things are currently organized. Um, we see that in lots of ways in different forms. Um, we see that in terms of even think when we think about things like housing segregation and neighborhood segregation about um, what's driving those kinds of things. Um, that uh, they're, they're, when, we, when we think about the conditions and experiences of all groups, we saw earlier in the thing that, that white families in Chicago are really thriving in a lot of ways. 
And so that's often uh, a barrier. I will say also in, this, in a place like the city of Chicago in which segregation is so deep that people often don't have any idea about what other communities are experiencing in the city. Um, and there's so much racial mythology um, and so, much, um, so many stereotypes kind of shaping people's views that their sense of why things are the way they are, um, are, are often deeply incorrect and inaccurate. I think you're muted. <laughs> wow, uh, thank you for that. It feels very um, like we have, like, there's more work than we even know we have to do sometimes when we, um, there's just so much what we call in seed, like the DK, DK, the what we don't know, we don't know kind of piece of that. Um, there is a question who that um, a couple of questions here. So early on in the in the talk, someone asked, uh, they were wondering if the Asian return on investment from education, I'm going to say this just the way it's written here, is also lower even when looking at degrees obtained in the US. For example, does that data consider an MD earned in China equivalent to an MD earned in the United States? Yes. So yes is the short answer. I mean, there's some we could get into the weeds of it. But Essentially, what this this isn't. I know some people think that maybe this is about the fact that your degree or your your credential that you earn somewhere else isn't being honored in the context of the U.S. Um, but that's not what we're seeing. So what we're seeing is, in fact, um, that Asian Americans, even those who are 1.5 or second generation, still are not getting equal returns. And some of this has to do with discrimination and things like um, when we look at management kind of positions, we see a fair amount of discrimination against Asian Americans who are seen as being good workers, but not good leaders, for instance, that sort of thing. Um, and so it's not just about foreign degrees. Yeah. But it is, I mean, one of the one of the things I will say, it's kind of as you, this question sort of invites me to share another piece of data, a piece of information that I would love that I didn't have time to do earlier which is that one of the things that we need to remember when we see high levels of education of Asian Americans is that much of that is about our immigration policy. It's not about, people often think oh, that's about like tiger moms or it's about some groups that just value education more. And really what we're seeing is that the H-1B visa programs we have for the most part are driving, so two thirds of Asian Americans in the city of Chicago are foreign born. And we are only for the most part uh, the, the number of people coming through family unification through other kinds of refugee policies are low. And so really what we're doing is admitting the most educated folks from these other places. And that's what's really driving education, high levels of education among these groups. So it's again, really important to understand the kind of legal um, and structural reasons for some of these things. So it's not about like necessarily differences in culture or values or any of that kind of stuff. Wow, it feels so complicated. And there's a, a, a question in um, the, the, the question box from Lucy, a sixth grader, and also another one from my, who I assume is an adult, and they're very similar. So I'm going to ask them to yeah. together. Um, Lucy asks, what is one way that you think Chicago can heal from our racial divide? Are there any concrete steps we can take? What is the real final goal? And the, the what I assume is an adult's question was, um, um, why, why do you think there are people who most, I'm sorry, who do you think are the people who most need to hear this information to start the wheels of change moving? So kind of like, what can we do and who are the change makers? Are we the change makers? Yes, I would say you are the change makers. I mean, I think, you know, so part of why I, you know, when, when I, when I decided which parts of the data or which to show, part of what I'm trying to do is, is, is show data that says a lot of people think this but this other thing is actually the case. And part of what I'm trying to show in, in, in doing this across this is, is to su suggest that um, if, if we had, you know, it's not just about information, right? As I said, part of it is about um, current arrangements of things that benefit some folks more than others. But in fact, if we had, if we were not living as segregated, if we were sharing communities, if we were in community together, if we saw each other as linked, as we saw each other, as we saw our fates linked, our futures linked in different kinds of ways, I think it would change our orientation. Again, putting a, giving a nod to one of your future speakers. I think the work that Tonika Johnson is doing is incredibly important along these lines, helping people to think about what does it mean? What are the kind of nature of the experiences of folks 
living in communities on other parts of the city. This is the folded map project where she matches people um, in different parts of the city by their address. So like 6700 North Ashland, 6700 South Ashland. Um, and she's bringing people together and introducing them. And it's having all kinds of interesting effects. So I have a colleague who happens to be working very closely with her, Maria Creason. And one of the things that they're finding in some of these matching these pairs is even how segregated our networks are. So one of the things that um, came up was a woman who owns a um, art gallery on the north side and said, well, I would love to feature some black and Latino artists. I just don't know any. And Tanika was like, I know a bunch. So like immediately connected her with a bunch of people. And so, so some of it is about how do we open up opportunity? How do we think about um, even our own social networks? Um, and the social networks in the organizations that we work in, the social networks that we, um, that we operate in, in in terms of thinking about opportunities for our kids. There's lots of ways in which um, all of us need to think about this as our work. There certainly needs to be some work to think about um, um, repair. You know, there's, there's many communities that have been starved of resources for a long time or have been places where resources have really been extracted from them. And the question is, how do we think about making communities, helping all communities to thrive in the city um, so that residents everywhere have, somebody raised a question in the chat earlier about transportation and access to jobs. And it's absolutely the case that the availability of public transportation across communities is nowhere near, near equal. The availability of healthcare or emergency rooms. There's lots of work that we need to do to have an orientation to the city that is really about thinking about the needs of neighborhoods. It's part of the reason why I talked so much about resources at the beginning is um, a lot of folks like the Field Foundation is leading a lot of really important work asking what does it mean to think about what, what the resources within communities and what communities need to thrive and a different kind of orientation to that would really lead to different kinds of public policies. I don't know if that answers all you, you asked about four questions so. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Um, <laughs> I was really struck by what, um, the idea, two things that you just said, the idea that our futures are linked, mm -hmm. um, that, and then you said repair, which is very much, um, I am not Jewish, but um, it is one of my favorite Jewish values, the idea of repairing the world. Um, and I, I see it in my colleagues and I see it um, in our institution in many ways. And um, it's related to a couple of questions that have also come in. Um, the idea that um, what's one person asked, why do white students benefit from segregated schools? And um, we could probably talk about how they benefit and, and there's also a cost to white. There's a cost to white people for segregation as well, although it doesn't feel that way. Um, but, you know, so just sort of, if you could talk about the idea of our futures being linked, the benefits to white folks, um, and then maybe even segue into like, as parents of private school kids, this is another, um, question in here, like, what can we do? Like, how, how do we not take advantage of these things? How do we think about our privilege? We want the best for our kids. That, that really complicated meaty, meaty belly question, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, okay, so um, one at a time. So how are our futures linked? I think there's lots of ways of thinking about it. One is just what kind of city are we? What kind of community are we gonna be? I think we have seen so much in, in, the, in the events of, of last week and the events of the last year in, in everything that has transpired in this country over the last four years, um, how destructive it is when we um, can't have real and honest conversations that are bridging across many different divides. And in particular, um, I think in, in a city like Chicago, there are also ways to think about it. The Metropolitan Planning Commission did another report and, and I wanna acknowledge, we don't in any way claim to be doing work that hasn't been done in lots of different ways in other places. We're just trying to bring it together in a way that, that people can access easily. Um, but they did a report on the cost of segregation and actually named and quantified the cost to the city and lost GDP and that sort of thing. So I think there's lots of ways to help people understand if in moral terms and ethical terms in um, terms of, of thinking about questions of justice and in economic terms, how much we all lose um, given the kind of conditions that we have right now. Um, so the question about um, segregated school. So absolutely you're right, Joanna, that like when our, when our kids are separate, there are lots of costs. There are lots of costs for them in terms of 
their understanding and their and their ability to be, to be critical and engaged citizens of the world and and to cross lots of different divides and and their it's cost to them in terms of thinking about their racial literacy how much are they able to have conversations across difference what do they know but in terms of um, on another dimension, if we look at funding in the city of Chicago and particularly in the metro area, and we look at the amount of money spent and invested in schools in the state, Illinois historically has had one of the most regressive state funding um, policies of any state in the country. That changed recently with um, thanks to a lot of the really important work of legislators, but also the um, Chicago um, CTBA, the, uh, tax and budget accountability, Ra Ralph Martiri and his folks. Um, in, and what's, what does that actually mean? It means that if you, if, you go, if you leave the state of Chicago and drive just a few miles in different directions, the per, people spending on, the per pupil spending on schooling goes up dramatically. So the inequality in funding across districts, just within the metro area, much less within the state, um, is dramatically different. And this is part of this legacy of us thinking of public schooling even as a kind of local affair. And, and that movement really came out of a lot of work, particularly in the South around segregation. So the reason why we have all these different little school districts, a lot of that was driven by our racial history. Um, the way we fund schools so inequitably, like basing on local property taxes and thinking of them as as responsibilities of localities rather than of state, for instance, is something related to our racial history. And so the benefit in some ways, I wouldn't say why do white children benefit from segregated schools, but the way that white kids benefit often from the schools that they, they go to is that they, they're they just far more resources invested in those schools, public resources invested in those schools. So the quality of education that they're receiving is just better. Um, and so we there are lots of ways that we could, we could um, talk about that. When I was talking about the school I meant earlier, what I was saying is that um, even in school buildings, not just across districts, white students often end up in the advantage educational spaces within a school, and that is to their benefit. They end up in, with the best teachers, they end up with the most rigorous curriculum, um, and that provides them lots of benefits for things like applying to college and all those kinds of things. So that's what I meant if I said benefit, that's what I meant. Um, I think there are lots of things that parents of independent school kids can do. Um, everything from really investing in making sure that your kids are racially literate. And I, what I mean, when I mean, when I say racial literacy, I mean that they know our complicated history, that they understand their place in that history, that they understand that um, that some families have resources and others don't, not because they don't work hard, but because of the accumulation of opportunity across time, across communities. Um, I think it makes a huge difference to help kids understand their social location, their identity, and how that shapes their life and their life experience. Um, and I think it also, um, there are lots of ways that we can build relationships either with other schools and other school communities. Um, it is incumbent on all of us, I think, to, to do better, to do more, um, and to make sure that um, our kids are, are in fact, have, have more information than we ever had when we were growing up. I mean, I understand a lot of times when, when the teachers I work with don't want to touch this stuff, when it's uncomfortable, they're afraid of making mistakes. Um, and I, I know we think automatically that future cohorts, the next generation is going to be better off, but that's not actually true. Um, so it is probably more true that the young people are a little bit more enlightened than we are. Um, but there's also a huge amount of recruitment among kids these days on the far right. I mean, it's just, there's, you know, it's, we have a lot of work to do. And that's true wherever our kids are located and whatever neighborhoods we live in. Um, there's a lot more that all of us can do to kind of dig in on this idea that, that we're all connected and that we all have a lot of um, a part to play. We do. We all have. I mean, I, I often think about like, what is what is the thing that you're good at? If you just sort of like aim that towards like um, connecting us, that would just do so much. We have a couple of questions about incarceration. Hmm. So um, one is from a sixth grader, Max Jury. He is wondering why the number of people in prison is so high. 
Um, Sadie, also a sixth grader, is wondering if black men are incarcerated more because they commit more crimes or because they are just punished more severely. Mm -hmm. And then there's another question from an attendee related to our Illinois incarceration rate relative to other states um, okay. in, in, in terms of like the rate and the ethnicity. Yeah. Okay. So um, the the history of incarceration in this country is is um, kind of dramatic, and it a lot of the rules and laws and the, the current trajectory. The United States used to incarcerate people in in similar rates to other countries around the world, and a lot of that changed in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, with the investment at the federal level and something called the war on drugs. And, and um, getting into the minutia of this probably is not that helpful at, at this moment, but it meant we, we instituted a whole bunch of new laws across the country that were aimed to punish people more, punish people longer, um, and particularly punish people um, for drug crimes. So when we look at incarceration rates over time, if I showed you a table, I'm not sure, the, the, the virtual background sometimes makes my hand disappear, but the, the numbers go up dramatically. But when we actually look at crime rates, crime rates over that same period of time are really flat. So the question is, why were we putting more people in prison, even as crime rates stayed flat? And a lot of the answer is we just started punishing people differently and we started policing differently. So one of the, one of the numbers I often use when I'm talking to my students is we'll look at, for instance, incarceration for marijuana related crimes or drug related crimes. Um, this is before a lot of the new laws were passed recently. And one of the things you find is that the, the amount of use of illicit drugs across communities is pretty similar. Like the same number of people across groups are using drugs. But when we look at who's getting locked up for nonviolent drug offenses, it's much, much higher in different groups. One way to think about this is how is really about how we police different communities and even how we lock people up for different drugs. So one of the one, a famous statistic that people talked about for a long time related to this is that cocaine is a, I'm, I'm providing probably more education than your sixth graders need, but cocaine is a particular drug and it comes in different forms. And for a long time, folks who had cocaine in one form, which was the powder cocaine, if you got caught with a certain amount of it, say 10 grams, you got a very light sentence. But if you got caught with the same amount of cocaine, a different form, crack cocaine, which was more prevalent in low-income communities, you got a mandatory 10-year sentence. So the same substance, chemically, but in different forms, had really different consequences. And in part, because of the ways that laws punished um, prevalence in some communities more than others. So part of the answer to your question about um, black men in crime is that what we find is that every stage of the criminal justice system from who is policed to who is arrested to who is charged to how they're charged, who's allowed plea deals, um, who is sent to prison, how long they're sent to prison at every single stage of that process, we find discrimination. Okay, and so what you find is that there is um, even how we police communities. So when I when when kids come to me at college, I ask them to think about the people they knew growing up and people that who who we knew had broken laws. Anything from speeding to it could be drug related use, could be vandalism of their school, all those kinds of things. And almost everybody, all the kids, you know, they're you know, adolescence is a tough time, and people like to push the boundaries. So there's lots of rule breaking that goes on. And a lot of that rule breaking is officially against the law in one form or another. But what you find is that kids who come from highly resourced communities don't tend to get punished for any of those things. People think of it as, oh, kids will be kids, things happen. Um, we should, and, and probably a lot of that's true that kids shouldn't be going to jail for those things. But in others communities, kids are going to jail for, for things that are equal to or more minor than those kinds of things. And even we see it in punishment patterns within schools themselves. So white kids are as likely to break the rules in, in schools as black kids are, but black kids are far more likely to get punished. And this is part of how racism works in kind of interpersonal ways and partly about the kind of rules and the kind of things we punish. So um, the, the practice of mass incarceration in this country has had devastating in consequences um, in communities, but again, um, we haven't worried about it as much until more recently because of the communities that are hurt and because 
we had these kind of long-term racist um, myths and stereotypes that suggested that some groups were sort of more criminal in some way, so therefore must be more deserving of, of being locked up. Um, Joanna, you probably have to clean this all up later, but um, hopefully that's a good quick summary of that for your sixth graders. It's going to be great. We're going to have lots of great questions and, yeah. and things tomorrow, tomorrow for sure. And, and for the adults, I, there's lots of great books that you can read about this, um, including the new Jim Crow um, and other things that will lay it all out for you beautifully. So anyway. Right. But. I want to ask one more question um, from one more student. And um, as I'm doing that, I'd love everyone who's still with us, which is remarkable. Um, I would like you all to just sort of think about a place in your life that you might have some space to move on this. Like, what is something that you can identify, however small, um, that might have sparked in you today that you're thinking, hmm, I'm going to investigate that, or I know exactly what to do, or I have more questions, but I'm going to, I'm going to get, try to get answers. And we'll sort of end tonight with everyone sort of throwing that into the chat as we, as we end. But this last question is from another sixth graders, way to represent sixth graders, very proud of you. Um, earlier, you mentioned that complaints made by Black or Latinx um, folks are not often followed through with. That was the filed ver filed complaints versus sustained slide, mm -hmm. um, uh, or at least not as often as white complaints are met. Is this segregation or something else happening that prevents the problems from being solved, such as location or funding? That's the question. So. Um the there are lots of different reasons why um, when we look at police complaints um, some of this is about class so um, again whose complaints are being um, recognized um, I, I kind of flashed over what we see is the way policing happens and the way in, in communities across the city are vastly different so the number of stops of people the number of stops on the street of folks. So like when people, when police are just doing kind of stopping people as they're walking around and checking on them, it's much more likely to happen in some communities than others. Even in predominantly white communities, African-Americans and Latinx folks and particularly men are much more likely to get stopped. Um, and so experiences with police and whether or not um, their complaints about policing are ever recognized are, are vastly different. Um, and the mechanisms for getting one's complaint recognized are, are complicated. And some of this is about um, the capacity to get legal representation and other kinds of things. But it also is, again, about the ways that our systems and institutions respond to different kinds of actors. So again, partly because we think of some groups as more inherently innocent than others and other groups as more inherent, we, we tend to read their complaints or their claims about being mistreated as, as more likely to be um, meritorious and deserving of, of attention, for instance, that sort of thing. Um, I think we've seen this recently in a couple of the really egregious cases of police, um, police overstepping bounds or police violence. When we see things that have happened in African-American communities in Chicago, that if it had happened anywhere else in the city would have just gotten so much press and so much attention. And it really is in some ways, I think, um, we all have to dig deep, you know, I mean, I think the, the slogan Black Lives Matter is so important because it highlights the, the persistent consequences of literally hundreds of years in this country of, de of, um, of denying the full humanity of some folks. So when we deny their full humanity, when we deny their right to full treatment, when they, we deny, when we engage in that, like literally over hundreds of years, the reverberations into the present are many, and, and all of us have a lot of work to do to think about um, whose pain we care about, um, whose, whose dignity we care about, um, and what it means to us when we're willing to let some communities suffer more than we would ever let communities of you know, other communities. And I think that's when you said, when you asked this question about what are all the th different things that we could do, um, I see even people talking about financial advising. Um, I, I can't tell you all these middle class families we talked about, Black and Latinx folks had so much trouble finding good financial advice. I mean, there, I, anywhere that you're situated, there is, there is so much important work to be done. Um, interrupting mythologies anywhere you hear it, doing all that work. I just love that you ended with that question, Joanne. I think it's really important. Um, and um, I am so thankful again that you, that you had me in to have this conversation and I, I'm sorry. I couldn't. I just couldn't help. I just kept showing. Couldn't. It couldn't. 
couldn't resist showing probably about 12 too many slides, but. Obviously people are, we're here for it. So, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I think it's remarkable that we have this many folks still on the call. So thank you so much for that. If you put your, your thing that you're doing, um, that your spark, um, in just a minute or two ago, repost it because it's now open to um, the the chat is now open to uh, not just the panelists but also the attendees. Um, if you'd like to share that, but um, um, Dr. Lewis, thank you so very much for all the energy you spent preparing for this tonight, for doing your best work to manage uh, a wide age range and audiences here this evening. And, um, and for, for speaking truth to us that is sometimes really hard to hear and is gonna require possibly some shifts in our own lives, but um, we when we know better, we do better, right? So um, thank you, thank you so much. Um, we are going to um, put on some slides and some music and so folks can continue to add um, their thoughts into the chat um, for a little bit longer. But um, thank you all for coming tonight. This was a, a great launch to our first speaker series and we hope to see you again on March 11th for Beryl Satter and on April 20th for Tonika Lewis-Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Lewis.